to <coughs> just a second okay so we'll start with block two yesterday we discussed block one we talked about uh, the different theories that has been uh, that has played a very important role in the development of lifespan psychology and uh, its perspective so Erickson's theory, Piaget's theory, Kolbuk's theory, Sigmund Freud, you're going to read in MPC3, that is social psychology, or maybe in personality you'll read, that is in MPC4. So today we'll talk about block two, that is unit one. And uh, again, it's a very simple block, just, uh, I mean, this unit is talking about uh, the different kind of physical changes, the growth and development that takes place between the year, between the age group of six to 11 years and uh, the motor skills that uh, that develops in uh, in between the age range of six to 11 years, the development of teeth, bones, muscles. So we'll talk about the physical development. They're very simple, nothing much has to be discussed, but just a general explanation to that. Then motor development, the activities and skills that get developed between six to 11 years. Uh, then disorders in physical development during this particular age group. And then what are the improvements in control and coordination of five fine motor skills? And then we also will see some kind of videos uh, related to this topic. And then body proportions, muscles and fat, and summary of physical development during school. So they're very simple uh, in the sense that um, it is universal across different cultures across the world. Uh, so, uh, though, yes, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, if this age range is given, then it's going to be a particular for every age range, every children, it could differ from time to time, from different age group, from different, from culture to culture as well. Uh, but still, there's something universal, so which we can apply in any country, any cultural context, any, any society or any country. Okay, so um, then... Uh, Many writers, they prefer this term as middle childhood. So there is this childhood also, pre-childhood, childhood, and then adult childhood. Uh, so we have this um, uh, this term, it is known as uh, middle childhood, and then it is written by Elkind and Wiener, 1974. And they've talked about middle childhood's a period from uh, between the age of five or six to about 11 to 12 years. So this is the time of leisurely growth between the more rapid growth of the preschool period and then the onset of adolescence. So it's a middle child because over here, the child moves from the preschool period and then there's the onset of the adolescence. So that's what they're talking about. definitely we you might have heard about the term individual differences so individual differences every individual they are unique in their own manner like intelligence personality aptitude attitude so even for the development also for the growth as well as cited by uh, Devdas and Jaya 1984 they have uh, talked about individual differences and it's high during this period as each child follows their own unique timetable of growth so there could be neurodevelopmental disorders there could be children who could uh, speak a uh, little late in their lives or there might be some children who, uh, as soon as they're born, um, after the birth, they might have cried a little late. So all these, uh, the, the milestones, the developmental milestones are very important. And uh, they differ from children to children. So, uh, yes. And... Uh, uh, the, all these factors are mentioned. Then um, the different uh, skills, the developmental tasks, the teachers, you know, the teachers, the parents, the uh, the caretakers, they're responsible for the development, the, the skills that is going to be uh, developed in the children. Like, uh, you know, they can uh, help in developing fundamental skills like reading, writing, calculating, and attitude towards social groups. An institute becomes as much the responsibility of the, the teacher as, a, as the parent. So all these factors are contributing then we also have um, physical growth in early years. Uh, so the physical growth, as you can see, um, it is the height and weight. We can talk about the height and weight. So increase in height and weight, uh, high, increase in height is at the rate of five to six cm annually. An average of girl 11 years should be the height of uh, one three. 139.2 cm and the uh, centimeter and the average for the same should be 138.3 centimeter so all this age they have mentioned about the different uh, age groups it's not particular to everyone it could differ from to differ uh, from country to country and from place to place also but there's something universal which they have mentioned so you can have a look at them
so uh, these are mentioned uh, it's a data of the indian context so uh, it could differ from your cultural setting so cult girls in the indian context uh, this is the age range and the height and weight in centimeters kg in weight in kg they have mentioned uh, now what are the factors so we have uh, <coughs> sorry so we have um, some factors so there are certain factors that could affect the size of the body so it was uh, given by Hollock 1978 and then they have talked about the various conditions that could influence the body size so one of them is the family influences the nutrition so family the hereditary the environment the genetic factors uh, even if a child uh, eats properly or if they if the if they have got the height from uh, the parents the the genetic factors plays a very important role in the um, size of the child the nutrition so well nourished children they're taller but uh, still um, they might reach puberty also sooner as compared to poorly nourished child uh, but uh, still again it's the family that is going to affect the the height or the size then emotional disturbance so persistent emotional disturbance can also cause certain kind of um, hormonal imbalance so the pituitary growth hormones cause delay in the growth spurt it prevents children from reaching the height they want they would otherwise attend so height again uh, you might have seen a malnutritious child, uh, they are very thin and poorly, their body is not that uh, developed. So it's also because of the stress, the hormones, the hormonal imbalance can cause a certain, certain um, situation. Then socioeconomic um, status, so we already talked about the malnutritious child. Uh, children from the low socioeconomic status can also, you know, they can impact, uh, it would impact the children's height and weight. So health, so children's health, children who have been ill since birth and there are many minor illnesses that, that could lead to uh, to the you know, delay in development, physical development or many other development. Then endocrine functioning, normal endocrine functioning results in normal size. Then these deficiency in growth hormones leads to dwarfism, while an excess growth leads to gigantism. Then sex, uh, girls at this age tend to be slightly heavier than boys. This and this difference. So girls, when they hit puberty, uh, they're more heavier as compared to boys in certain, you might have seen in certain studies and cultural contexts also. So that's one thing. Then there are, here are certain studies we should definitely read uh, by 10 and 1978, Harris 1993. They've talked about the, there, all these studies has been conducted in support of the evidence. Then Polly, and also one more thing, let me tell you, when you write your answers in the examination, your assignment, this is how you're going to present your answers. You should definitely cite certain studies and they're, they're, they're very old studies. So you should cite some recent studies and you can read about them. Then uh, the growth and development year-wise that takes place between 6 to 11 years. So years, uh, they have mentioned the average height and weight, 6 years, 6.5 years, 6 puberty, then 6 to 11 years, the growth, all, all it has been mentioned, the average height. So nothing much we have to discuss here. But all these are there. Then uh, one point two point motor skills in growth and uh, development. So motor skills, uh, there are various other development in the females, uh, breast development and many other things, you know, enlargement of the testicles and all this stuff. So you'll see in when they, they hit the puberty and all the sexual characteristics, the reproductive system, they've talked about certain things. Uh, then the development of teeth, bones, and muscles. So by the time a child is three years old, the child has 20 teeth, and then 28, and then 32, and then an adult. So bones, um, calcium deficiency, as you know, it's a very common uh, phenomenon now. So sufficient calcium should be there in the bones to make them strong. Then muscles and fat. Um, so again, it depends from individual to individual, the the, the kind of development has, that has taken place, the um, hereditary factors also plays a role in muscles and fat in the child. And motor development, uh, there is this gross motor coordination. So when they hold a pencil, are they able to hold it properly? You know, are they using their entire palm to hold a pencil when they are three years old, when they go to preschool? So that is the gross motor skills they have to uh, look after. Then uh, next is fine muscular coordination. So it could be uh, 
it could be like uh, when they're writing something from the blackboard in the notebook so how are they able to do it or not uh, the then are they able to walk run jump kick properly so all this should be developed by the between the age of 6 to 11 years proper development should be done uh, across different cultural settings also that what the researchers have uh, talked about then activities and skills between 6 to 11 years it could be uh, they should be able to balance, they should be able to hop on one foot for longer periods, they should be able to skip the rope, and they should be able to play, you know, all those stuff, all this development should be between uh, all, they should complete it by 11 years now. Then we also have some disorders in physical development that could take place in this age group. So uh, attention deficit disorder, so hyperactive or hypoactive, uh, so it is uh, children with this disorder are distractible, impulsive, irritable, they're moody, uh, slow in learning, inattentive, physically such children tend to move from one side to another and they cannot exhibit, inhibit action and are constantly diverted by sounds and objects. And uh, they, are, they are always chaotic in their behavior and they tend to forget what they're told to do, cannot do sequentially other talks. The child may be annoying and unpopular among peers also. They're hyperactive, so children with disorders show, uh, so show less uh, than normal activity levels and excessive daydreaming. Uh, they may be quiet and undistracting in the behavior uh, to attend certain talks also. Then execution of motor skills. They're not able to play. They're not, they're, they, they have a very less... Uh, uh, less interest in certain sports activity also or they're not able to hold or they're not able to improve their motor skills with this kind of disorders also ADHD ADD attention deficit disorder or ADHD also it's a very common phenomena in young kids these days we'll see certain kind of uh, what are the brain areas responsible we'll see that then improvement in control and coordination of fine skills so they have to uh, the, the proper uh, the development should take place otherwise they'll not be able to hold pencil or any other activities should will not be able to will be done by them so brain maturation is very important participation in certain activities in the uh, in certain sports activities very important so this could all this could lead to physical growth and motor development then body proportion as we talked about yesterday also uh, the two types of law proximal and the other one so all these are very important uh, for their growth and proper development should be done and there's some study by swash 1990 they've talked about the muscles and fat Although it's a genetic factor, but still, uh, all this has to be looked after. So their lung capacity, respiratory, many children, they're facing uh, asthma these days because of the pollution. So all this has to be looked after uh, in this uh, unit. So summary, you know, all these activities are provided and um, all the kind of uh, development that takes place is the sensory system, they mature, heart and lungs continue to mature, brain growth is completed by 11 to 12 years, that's what Piaget has also talked about in his theory, the last stage, formal operational stage, and uh, the logical reasoning, the analytical reasoning, all this uh, gets developed at this particular stage. So, but, but at the same time, the correct kind of environment should be provided to the child. It's not just hereditary, but even the environment. So growth during school years is slow and steady until puberty when girls lead to mature first. And girls, they hit the puberty as um, earlier as compared to boys. So that, that's what makes them taller and heavier than boys. And uh, the growth is concentrated in the legs, arms and face and all this activity takes place. And motor skills development, uh, proper training should be given. So training like uh, running, jumping, squeezing, foot movements, balancing, throwing and catching all this uh, research by Ellen Horn 1998 all this has been mentioned all these are research based it's not just any simple activities or some kind of uh, notes but they're all research based and you definitely have to read them um, all these are some common uh, activities that could help them to even develop the handicraft skills you know such as ceramics needlework painting and model building you know, and then uh, finger dexterity than boys. G girls, they continue to have greater hand and finger dexterity than boys. So uh, eye-hand coordination. So there are many children who are not able to uh, note the things uh, properly from the blackboard. So it's a problem. Eye-hand coordination is very important for the child. So uh, the major development uh, that could, major motor developments are listed here. So children improve in running, jumping, and other activities. Children are skilled. Uh, 
they should be more skilled with sports games music hobbies and reaction time improves their eye hand coordination should improve competitive sports participation in common doing this this are common light uh, left right discrimination improves handedness so your right brain and your left brain uh, the uh, both the activities they manage different different both the brain or the both the hemisphere they manage different activities so that also improves your handedness so there are many children who are not able to write properly with in, in like um, untidy handwriting so all this head in eye hand coordination so these are motor skills that has to be developed in the child so here is the summary you can uh, look for this so that is uh, unit one now when it comes to unit two okay before that we can have a video also on what exactly um, what happens in adhd I've spent 10 years of my life talking about stock markets and a little more than that in investing. What most people know or think they know about attention deficit disorder or ADD is that it's used to describe someone who can't stay focused. And when they really can't focus, they have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. This continuum from one to the next isn't quite how it works though. ADD and ADHD are actually synonymous, as in they're the same. ADD is an outdated term used prior to 1987, after which it evolved into ADHD to encompass more of the symptoms that people with ADHD often experience, which in addition to being inattentive, includes both hyperactivity and impulsiveness. So somebody might be diagnosed with ADHD because they have symptoms related to not being able to pay attention but they might also be diagnosed with ADHD if they have symptoms related to being overly active and impulsive. They might also have ADHD if they have symptoms of both. According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, the fifth edition, the most recent update being in 2013, ADHD is split into three subtypes, inattentive, hyperactive impulsive, or both. Inattentive and hyperactive impulsive have a set of nine symptoms each. For example, someone with the inattentive subtype might make careless mistakes or not listen or be easily distracted. And someone with the hyperactivity and impulsive subtype might fidget or squirm around or get up from their chair often. Now, you might be thinking that everyone fidgets now and then, right? Well, a diagnosis is given when someone has six of the nine symptoms or either subtype for at least six months. Most commonly, though, children have symptoms of both subtypes and therefore have the combined subtype. Since ADHD is considered a neurodevelopmental disorder, the symptoms also have to have started between age 6 and 12, and the behavior can't be appropriate for their age. All right, but what causes someone to be hyperactive or impulsive or inattentive? Well, as you might guess, it's pretty complicated, and we don't really know. Probably a lot of different factors, and ultimately they all fall into some combination of environmental and genetic factors. One interesting clue to a genetic component of ADHD is looking at families. For example, a child with a sibling that's been diagnosed with ADHD is more likely to develop it themselves. Furthermore, if those siblings are identical twins, meaning they have the same DNA, their chances of developing ADHD is considerably higher. Having identical DNA doesn't mean that the twin is definitely going to develop ADHD, though, which again suggests that both genetic factors and environmental factors play a part. As to a specific gene, it's probably not one single gene that leads to ADHD, but rather multiple genes that determines how severe their symptoms are. These genes likely influence the production or regulation of the brain's neurotransmitters, which are signaling molecules in the brain that are released by one neuron and received by receptors of another neuron. This movement of a neurotransmitter from neuron A to neuron B is basically a message being relayed. It's like the neurons are talking. Dopamine is a specific neurotransmitter that gets released when the brain's involved with behaviors like getting a reward, taking a risk, and being impulsive. Norepinephrine is another neurotransmitter involved in attention and arousal. It's thought that lower amounts of these two neurotransmitters floating around contributes to symptoms of ADHD. 
The reason why these neurotransmitters might be down in the first place is still not well understood, and research remains ongoing. Now, treatment for ADHD can be tricky, since symptoms might vary from patient to patient, although it most often involves either behavioral psychotherapy, medication, or both. Behavioral psychotherapy is often targeted at children and focuses on teaching the child better time management and organizational skills. For example, having structured routines that they can follow and then giving rewards when they stick to those routines. Also, involving both parents and teachers are important, and both behavioral parent training and behavioral classroom management have been shown to be helpful for children with ADHD. For adults, behavioral psychotherapy might focus on ways of decreasing distractions and also improving organizational skills. If medications are prescribed, typically the first line options are stimulants. Since it's thought that low levels of neurotransmitters are involved in ADHD, stimulants are used because they tend to increase the number of neurotransmitters, like dopamine, between neurons, therefore reducing symptoms. Common and well-known ADHD medications are molecules that are chemically similar to illicit stimulants, like methamphetamine. But there are some key differences to keep in mind here. All of these chemicals help to increase the release of dopamine from neuron A, but the ADHD medications typically cause a slow release of dopamine, whereas illicit stimulants like methamphetamine cause a really fast release of dopamine. In fact, it's this incredible surge of dopamine that disrupts normal communication between neurons and produces euphoria, and is the reason that illicit substances like methamphetamine are highly addictive. In contrast, the slow and controlled release of dopamine caused by ADHD medications is key and helps a lot of patients improve their focus and their attention. Thanks for watching. You can help support us by donating on Patreon. So uh, this is one of the topic that you have seen in ADHD. Uh, we'll also see learning disorders, mental retardation, and various other uh, developmental delays or issues that is reported in this unit. We'll see that. And uh, coming to this topic, that is unit two, cognitive, social, emotional, and moral development. We have already seen the theories yesterday. So uh, in this unit, we have to look at Piaget's theory. So we already have seen this. Uh, the video also we have seen, the description also we have seen yesterday, and uh, the concept formation, the language development, we'll see um, how language is developing. We have seen that in unit one also, it's a kind of repeated thing. Then uh, social development, we'll see uh, this one. So uh, Piaget's theory, that is physical, yeah, cognitive development and moral development, we are already done. We'll see these two theories, and then we can move on to some other theories also in the next unit so i hope that is clear yes miss yeah? yes miss yeah. yes, so miss. I'm, i'll not go straight forward sorry pretty straight forward uh -huh. yes i'll just move on to the next topic because we have seen uh, many of the topics yesterday also so I'll not go one by one, but yes, I definitely assure you all that if you read, you will understand it. They're all research-based studies. So please make sure that you study them. And uh, so this talk, uh, topic is talking about uh, the uh, social development, that is relationship with parents. So like there are various studies like uh, by Cronlick and Ryan 1987. So they've talked about that parents, they have to be very uh, open to their child. They need to communicate their doubts. The, uh, they should be approachable. The parenting should be done in such a way that the parent should come and uh, the parent should help the child to understand, you know, and then help the child to develop this self-esteem, a high self-esteem and become a very supportive parent. Otherwise, that could, uh, otherwise, if you're not supportive as a parent, then that is not going to create any, um, it's not going to help the child and they could have a low self-esteem and another research by bombard 1971 it shows that children with household responsibilities behave in more nurturing helpful and mature ways than those who do not have no such demands upon them so it's a kind of research that not that's not what i'm saying but it's a kind of research so they it creates self-confidence and self-esteem you know 
uh, it, it is done and uh, they, they, lear they learn how to behave properly in a certain situation. So their self-esteem is also built. Then you remember Erickson's one of the stage, the fourth stage, initiative versus inferiority. Infer industry versus inferiority, remember that? So when children, they take proper initiative in household activities also, they develop a proper uh, self-esteem in them. Otherwise, they will feel inferior that they're not competent and no, they don't have any kind of responsibility. So uh, that's that's kind of a support the parents could provide. Their peer groups, so peer groups, they need to have. Uh, so it is believed that siblings are required uh, for proper growth of the children. So even if you have seen if uh, some kind of adoption takes place for a child, if the child has a sibling, so the 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 organization makes sure that both the child they live in the same house, and uh, they are treat they are you know they live in the same house and they uh, have a proper understanding. So peer group is very important again. And there are certain studies, and if you remember uh, Brown Fanner's model also we have done. Uh, in the first unit, uh, sorry, in MPC one, he has talked about the culture, the society that plays a very important role in uh, in in building the experience of children. So peer support is very important. Then, our uh, our who, whom we like, you know, our friends, our society, our neighbors, that is also going to play a role. Then teachers negative. So typically. Uh, when we get indulged in conflict with our teachers that's going to be very bad and if our teacher doesn't accept us or you know all this could also lead to certain issues and low self-esteem and uh, it could lead to development of low self-esteem in children right then next is um social metric reaction rejections so if they're rejected by their uh the, by, by certain people in the society that could lead to certain disagreements so we have a uh, research also by Selman 1980 and he does suggest developmental progression in child's friendship so playmates they need to have playmates to whom they can play they need to have assistant between the age group of four to nine who's they can they can take help then cooperators six to twelve then nine to fifteen they have mutual support and then above, above twelve they are independent and they help each other in times of need then another is social cognition theory. So yesterday we talked about the egocentrism, the concept of say, egocentrism. Three to chill, seven year children, they don't, don't understand what the other's perspective. They understand what they want and what uh, actually they need at the right time, at, at a particular time. Then social information, four to nine years, uh, they would uh, hold, you know, they would have a viewpoint, but they will feel that uh, that they will not be understood and they don't want to understand other individuals' viewpoint also and self-reflective and then that happens between say six to twelve years they want to uh, understand other viewpoint you know and uh, next is 10 to 12 years they switch perspective and they want to go with others uh, perspective you know whatever i mean if they if somebody agrees with them they would agree otherwise they'll not agree social conventional it would be again understanding others perspective also and if you in society's viewpoint then uh, next we have self-esteem. It refers to uh, self-appraisal, and uh, William James also has talked about the self worth. is a, it's a direct function to the difference between what I would like to be and what I think I am. So it's very important that we have, as a child, we have a proper and high self-esteem. Otherwise, that could lead to problem in certain areas. So high self-esteem could we could develop high self-esteem in children by. Uh, by being uh, by being very good in academics or athletics or physical appearance, you know, social acceptance and morality. So all this influence our high self esteem. But still, we have to, as a parent, as a society, as a teacher, we have to look after this that uh, they understand the children. They have they develop a proper high self esteem. Okay. So Piaget's theory we have already talked about. Uh, uh, so you can understand the concept of egocentrism, you know, and then imminent, uh, Piaget has also talked about imminent justice, quite similar to the Kohlberg's theory. So wrongdoing invariably leads to punishment, then objective consequences. So they believe that uh, we have to, whatever the society has said, we have to do that only. Then absolutism, so young children, they believe in the concept of absolutism of moral perspective. They believe that there is only one correct. So whatever, there is only one correct situation and nothing else. And stages of autonomy is quite similar, quite similar to the Kohlberg's theory, the stages he has talked about. And above 10 years, we believe that whatever uh, the whatever uh, right is uh, 
whatever the right thing is there on part of the individual that has to be done so it's about if uh, in in this uh, situation if you ask according to piaget if you ask children above 10 years they will say uh, hence should have uh, stolen the medicine and then given to the wife and then he can go to jail so all this um, topic he has talked about like yesterday also we talked about Kohlberg's um, theory so uh, the first is the pre-conventional level then punishment obedience over here uh, whatever rules has been set uh, that one also has to be followed at the conventional level we want to maintain we want we want to you know avoid uh, punishments uh, we want to be a nice boy and a nice girl so maintaining social orientation that is our agenda and at the third at the last stage post conventional level whatever right whatever it is right for us uh, that has to be done so that's what they have talked about and not call books but even we have researchers from hug Hushan and mark me so they also have done a classic study of 10,000 children in 1928 to 1930 and they found that students who support rigid moral standards don't necessarily behave in ethical and desirable ways 9 to 11 years children are quick to find excuses to justify their own rules in fraction solving moral dilemmas involving trying to involves try to coordinate several sets of conflicts, needs and motives, including the law of the culture, the morality of peers, parents and teachers, guidelines and self-interest. The third and fourth grader may be able to identify moral of a story, but may not be able to apply it. So moral decision make benefits from practice and maturity and from specific instructions on how to generalize moral principles to life. So there are various other studies you can find in them then so uh, the theories that comes under the cognitive development was given by piaget and uh, erickson uh, then we have moral development by kolberg as you can see and uh, no no particular theory was given in this social context but society if you look at the Bronfenner's model i can i'll just show you from Fenner's ecological theory i think we have seen this earlier also so if you see this, uh, we have talked about this. So it's not just our family and friends, but our neighborhood, but our society also that that plays a very important role in uh, in the development in the, in our development as a child. So this theory is very important. You can read them in uh, social development. Then coming to emotional development, uh, again, it's a very uh, very important criteria. Uh, you, as a as a as an adult, you might be feeling that you are dependent on some individuals for your emotional uh, emotional thing. So there is certain study that has been conducted by Devdas and Jaya, 1984. They they talk about uh, the roles of older child are well defined. So he has uh, to be, you know, the older child, they are always ready, and then they are pent up. They have pent up emotional energy through games and feelings and the feelings of frustration is less with improvement in skills so uh, uh, the the common emotional patterns that we could see in child is fear we create fear we create anxiety in children you know all this uh, belongs to the age group of six to six uh, four to six years then anger uh, sometimes the children they throw them you know tantrums temper tantrums which is uh, which will in decrease according to age but that also has to be controlled they're very curious in life and they wanted to know everything you know they want to um, have certain activities they want to be, wear the mother's uh, hairstyle and you know they want to act like their fathers so all these are some activities they enjoy pleasure and delight there's also some uh, emotional dimensions which they want to experience so they're always happy you know and they don't have any tension and uh, all these activities are done by them certain activities so here uh, we have the end of unit two and unit three uh, unit three is talking about the writing skills the basic skills that a child has to learn so uh, it's the uh, yeah so john dewey uh, an american philosopher psychologist and educational reformer he has talked about some basic uh, needs you know the needs that shape or uh, reshape or recognize uh, it has to be recognized and uh, that is important for a child so the social instinct the language instinct 
uh, the constructive instinct, the investigation instinct, the expressive for the art. So all these are very important. So social would include conversation, personal intercourse, uh, communication, language, social expression. Constructive would include how they're constructive, how expressive they are in their play movements. Investigative would how they are very curious. Are they using the abstract reasoning or not? Then expressive would be how are they communicating their uh, full manifestation. Uh, they will do, you know, construct uh, their daily life in a constructive manner. All these are very important for schooling. So that's what they're talking about. And then this unit also talk about the three basic R's, learning to read, learning to write, and um, learning, uh, so developing math skills also. So learning to reading, writing, and maths. All this, you know, uh, you might have seen that there are certain parents who take children to different uh, language schools also, so language training, proper language training is also done at this age, four to six years. Then computer skills also, so it has to be, children need to, need to uh, start learning computers by the age of around 11 or 12 years. And again, it is uh, supported by Greenfield 1984. So uh, they're also taught different language. So teaching for knowledge like geography, history, and uh, other like science, language teaching, literature, all has to be done before uh, 12 years so that they understand their interests and they understand in what they are capable of, what language or what subject is better for them, if they are interested in which subject. So in value education, your uh, moral science, you know, vitality, courage, sensitivities, intelligence, curiosity, all this also has to be looked after. And then it's a uh, research supported by DV. And uh, they talked about uh, different, different criteria that makes a child effective in their studies. Then physical education at the same time, teaching for pleasure. They should also teach, you know, we, we used to play as a teacher and student, you know. So uh, all these activities should also be there. Then educational excursions, excursions. So they need to visit museums and some tours, some picnic should be done for them so that they learn by practical. Practical knowledge is very important because they learn by imitation. So again, the concept of imitation you will see in unit, uh, you'll see in S, uh, MPC 3 or MPC 4, I guess. So that's uh, unit 3. Then now, what are the issues? So we have seen physical, we have seen social, cognitive development, emotional development, moral development. Now, what are the issues that uh, creates a problem in children, in school children? So we have uh, learning disabilities. Causes of learning disability, we'll see. Then identification, the process, the remedy. Then mental retardation, ADHD, we have already seen that. Then we also have orthopedically handicapped children, hearing and visual impairment. Then gifted and general uh, talented children. All these are some of the issues in young children. So we are going to see that. So here it is. Uh, I mean, uh, various studies has been done by Kirk 1972. So he defines exceptional child as child who deviates from the average of nor or normal child. And the mental characteristics, their sensory abilities, their neuromuscular physical characteristics, their social emotional development in their co communication abilities, multiple handicaps are there. So these are certain kind of exceptional children you will see. And they're very re at risk. And such children also have, uh, they don't have at certain learning disabilities, but there's there's some kind of tricks uh, you will see that uh, then uh, special education so there's this term special education so after your master degree you can also get a degree in special education and chill chill and treat children with special needs uh, so they have been divided into two groups one is learning disabilities speech or language impaired mental retardation emotionally or behavioral disturb physically impaired autistic uh, deaf, blind, trauma, brain disorder, severe multiple handicap, and then the other one is gifted or talented. So for both the groups, the teacher has to design their pedagogy, their uh, their knowledge, their uh, their learning materials in such a way that both the groups can learn things differently. There are you know there are certain activities that has to be done. Then now what is learning disability? So specific, there are certain kind of learning disability that. Uh, has been defined and a lot of work has been done since 1950 by William and uh, Samuel and many other researchers. So they define Reber and Reber 2001, they define learning disability is a syndrome found in children of normal or above intelligence characterized by specific difficulties in learning to read, to write and to grade 
appropriate mathematics dyscalculia so there are three types of learning disability dyslexia dysgraphia and dyscalculia so it's a brain area it's a neurological uh, disorder um, we'll see a video also on this and then um, they're not able to understand dyslexia they're not able to understand the proper uh, grammar, uh, grammar uh, in the English language or in a particular language. Dysgraphia, they will not be able to write it properly. Eye hand coordination is less. And dyscalculia, as it is suggesting that uh, they are scared of maths and they're not able to, to solve the mathematical problems. And what are the characteristics of learning disability children? So it's a mo mixed group of disorders. It's not just one, but uh, yes, there are many other. I mean, there could be one or two or maybe more than two. Then uh, the and then when do we identify it start at the school setting and then persist till adulthood but yes but if by practice this could be treated and it could be prevented not prevented but treated in some way then learning disability children are normal in intellectual functioning but there's some areas of lies that is affected so one area could be you know one or two areas could be affected they behave very behavioral problems also then they're social emotional they don't want to uh, show their emotions and there are certain emotional problems at the same time and um, um, you know all these characteristics are there so boys are more likely to be characterized as ld than girls so due to the brain structure we'll see, we'll see that and uh, learning disability has a criteria from mild to severe so is it mild moderate or severe so it's characterized under three categories that one uh, any kind of test has to be done uh, based on the severity level so all this um, and now what could happen when there's a developmental milestone when there's a developmental delay it could lead to behavioral and affective characteristics disorders of attention perceptual motor impairment you know uh, so uh, disorders of memory and thinking specific academic problems we'll we'll see all this and then uh, disorder of speech then causes of ld so what are the causes so causes could be environmental model uh, when the child was in the womb so uh, what what uh, problem has led you know to the unhealthy influence then brain damage again brain damage uh, happens it's a neurological damage that could cause learning disability in organic and biological model so uh, certain instances the neurotransmitters vitamin deficiency when the child is in the womb so all this could also create a problem then genetic model definitely from parents uh, you know, so this could also get transfer then identification process of learning so we have certain scales like bachelor's intelligence scale for children we already have seen this in our in certain videos if you remember then uh, woodcock woodcock uh, johnson psychoeducational battery and there are many others so begins diagnostic inventory of basic skills all these are some tests so through this measurement we can understand and measure what kind of learning disabilities are there so it depends from culture to culture also but this the bachelor's ways uh, uh wisc3 it's a it's a universal test so it could be applied to different cultures as well then we have remedies now what remedies could be provided so remedies could be like learning uh, it could be direct instruction we can give instruction we can understand the cognitive instru uh, cognitive perception of the child uh, how they're responding how they're recalling how they're rehearsing then monthly sensory so there are certain sensory uh, integration programs that could be conducted for certain children then uh, they, there are certain special educators and uh, they and they are trained in in certain activities like metacognitive skills on how to deal with uh, their test you know so it's not that these children will not be able to learn but they have to be given some extra time and some different way of pedagogy to teach all the uh, information to them and inclusion strategies these children should not be separated from the normal kids they should be with them and then extra effort has to be put on part of the teacher and the parents and the school administration and we also can take help from friends you know their friends and computer assisted we have visual reality uh, which is helping ADHD children will see that. So uh, all these are some kind of activities. Then mental retardation. So mental retardation, IQ score. So those children who have an IQ below 70, they are, uh, they have a certain kind of uh, activities. I mean, there are certain kind of uh, IQ. I'll, I'll show you one IQ score range. So.
So as you can see, this diagram, it's a, again uh, constructed, it's an IQ classification that has been done long back by many researchers like Binet and Simeon and many other. So they have identified, so those individuals with IQ below 60 or 70, 69 or, you know, they have a low IQ, 70 to 79 borderline, 80 to 89 low average, 90 to 110, 109 average. So we, many of us, uh, we fall under this category, as you can see, it's the 50% of the population, the 68% of the population, then 110 to 111 high average, 120 to 129 superior, and then above that, very superior. So Albert Einstein, um, yeah, er, you know, Einstein and many other researchers, they were considered to have 130, very superior intelligence. So uh, that's what you will see, classification of MR. In this, we have uh, seen that. Now, what are the remedies we can, you know, we can provide? Again, the remedies are that we need to take help of special educators. Certain intervention programs has to be provided on part of the schools. Regular classroom should be there, but they also need to have uh, extra time and inclusion criteria should be there. So extra time should be given them. Certain strategies could be given them. So effective teaching strategies should be given them. You know, all these are mentioned here. Uh, they need to have, uh, they need to reduce their distraction, proper food, a uh, less intake of sugar, their neurotransmitters should be managed. Medicines are not recommended all the time, but if it's a severity is there, then medicines are also given. But again, this medicine has to be given on uh, by, it, it has to be prescribed by the psychiatrist, not by a psychologist. So that one has to be done. Then ADHD, we already have seen. We have seen ADHD according to DSM-5, uh, but uh, DSM, don't go with DSM-3. It's an old version. Read DSM-5. It's the new version. And all this activity I mentioned, symptoms and other activities. Then uh, other uh, handicapped uh, situation we find in children is the cerebral palsy. So that affects the movement posture and uh, it con they, that controls the brain. So there's this brain injury due to oxygen deprivation during birth and many other activities. Then spastic um, stiffness, you know, stiffness and tense, poorly, uh, poorly coordinated movements and low uh, at, at toid we have so it's the involuntary movement and contorted purposeful movement. All these are some uh, part of cerebral palsy and uh, orthopedically handicapped children, are, uh, it is mentioned here. Then hearing and visual impairments, a lot of research has been done. Now we do have certain instruments uh, in this area also that are helping children to uh, help to pursue their education. So this is also one of the part and uh, the role of teachers are there that has to be taken care of. Then those who are gifted and talented children, so they also has to be, uh, they have to be looked after by uh, the teachers and what extra activities could be given to them. So all these uh, are some of the topics that you'll find in block two. I don't know if you have read or not, but please make sure that you read them. Otherwise, uh, it's very simple. It's very easy also. But I would request you all to read and then uh, we can find some questions and some queries in this. Uh, we can also, I wanted to show you all a video on what was the topic. Uh, Yeah, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, and dyslexia, learning disabilities, why it happens, and what are the reasons we'll see. Welcome to Teachings in Education. I am your narrator, Frank Avella. Here we're going to look at some various types of learning disabilities and disorders. Now let's dive right in with one of the most notable learning disabilities, which is dyslexia. Overall, it is a reading disability. Students also have trouble decoding words. Next up is dyscalculia, which is a math learning disability that hinders the student's ability to understand mathematical related concepts. Dysgraphia, which is next on the list, is a neurological disorder of writing and written expression. Students will lack the fine motor skills necessary to put words down on paper. Dyspraxia, another disability, 
is a neurological motor disorder where students have impairments with their fine and gross motor skills. A visual processing disorder is one where students are unable to visually take in information through their eyes. These children also have perceptual impairments, auditory processing disorder, also known as central auditory processing disorder in children, occur when there is an inability to interpret speech. Next is ADHD, which stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, which is a medical condition that affects a student's ability, pay attention, or exhibit self-control. Anxiety disorders are psychiatric in nature. Students with this disorder have extreme fear and worry. Anxiety disorders include panic disorder, Bipolar disorder is a mental illness marked by extreme fluctuations and changes in a person's mood. Individuals with bipolar disorders have an elevated mood called mania. Depression is a mood disorder that causes a persistent feeling of sadness and a loss of interest in life itself. Depression cases are currently on the rise. Now, although many don't associate PTSD with school age children, it does happen. Many children experience various sorts of childhood trauma. Next on the list is autism spectrum disorder. This disorder is a, is a developmental disability marked by difficulties in communication, social interaction, and behavioral challenges. People with language disorders have trouble expressing themselves, as well as being able to understand what others are saying. This disorder is more common among younger children. Eating disorders include a range of psychological disorders that cause unhealthy eating habits. They include obsessions with food, body weight, and body shape. OCD is a mental disability where unwarranted obsessions urge a person to do something over and over and over again to the detriment of that person's life. Insomnia is a sleep disorder where a person has trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. Insomnia may last only a week or two in some cases. Next up is schizophrenia, which is a very serious type of mental illness. It affects how a person thinks, feels, reacts, and behaves. Individuals may have hallucinations, delusions of grandeur, and violent outbursts. Lastly is a personality disorder, which is characterized by people having an unhealthy and rigid pattern of thinking, functioning, and behaving. Students with personality disorders don't know how to act in certain situations. Right now, I just want to say thank you for your time. Please subscribe to this channel. Hit the thumbs up button. Okay, we, we just have to see that the three types of uh, learning disability, dyscalia, dysgraphia, dyspraxia, all this. Uh, but they've talked about other disorders also. You can skip that. Uh, I'm not finding some good videos on this, but maybe I'll search for more and then we can talk about this. So any questions as of now, class? No, ma'am. Okay, how is the topic? How is block two? How do you find it? What, miss? Sorry. Interesting, miss. Interesting. Um, good morning, colleagues. Good morning. Um, for, for the teachers in Guyana, can you um, tell us a little bit about um, in schools? Um, is this uh, the, for like children with ADHD? And so are the same teachers um, teaching those children in school? Because I know there are special schools in certain regions. Can somebody shed? Um, they are special schools, but um, they are teachers now in the training college. We are teaching. They are not specialized in terms of um, in terms of diagnosing these kind of disorders, but they are kind of um, trained in special needs now. And through the same goal program, we have a lot of teachers doing special needs too. So um, I hope in the next year or two they will have. Um, teachers who can diagnose and kind of refer to um, specialists and so on. But for now, there are certain special schools in certain regions, but not all the regions. Like I'm from region two, we're now getting one in region two. And we hope that uh, after this goal, um, 
program which um some teachers are at um Jane's oh, University. So they will have some um kind of knowledge in terms of having these children um with the special curriculum designed for them. Thank you. Morning. Good morning. Morning everyone. I um I have a little well, I won't say it's a problem because it can be solved, but what I do find sometimes when these children pupils, students, et cetera, come to the school. Some of the parents do not want to accept. You know, as a teacher, even though you're not trained, you would know the difference between the children sometimes, right? But you try to work around because some of the parents would not accept. They would always say, you know, my child is good. Uh, he or she behaves well at home. They, they do not want to accept. And who, who am I to, you know, diagnose that, yes, this child has a problem, but deep within, we do know that they have a problem. So what Sir Samuel is saying, you know, when we have these teachers trained and they come back, they will, you know, be able to refer to some doctors or something because no matter what strategy, I've been in the profession for years and I've tried all I know. And some children, you know, they, they still wouldn't grasp the concept, but we still work with them. We don't give up at all. So my, my bottom line of this whole thing is that parents do not I mean, want to accept that these children are, you know, of these problems that's my thing very true that's very true i have the same problem at the school where i'm at yes ma'am this, this is you sorry um this is you um that we be experiencing in all the classrooms however some for some regions are more um equipped to deal with the situation because i know i am from region six and there are number there are a number of teachers who would have been exposed to what we call inclusive learning or differentiated learning um we understand that differentiated learning uh, is done generally but we would have had experience or the opportunity to do some courses especially where it relates to um intellectual disability to work with um children with special need and so sometimes we are able to relate to these children even though we have uh, a special needs school in region six here um the level um of disability indicates if the child goes to that school or stays in the regular classroom so we are trying to work with those children based on the information or the knowledge and the training that we have but we we are able to put them in those school in those levels. For instance, especially in school with those children that have um, the extreme level of disability compared to a child who doesn't have uh, the high level of disability. They stay in the regular classroom, and we we try to work with them. But this is a challenge for some persons who are not um, trained. Okay, so is this differentiated learning? Does it only apply to? Um it's just for primary school, right? No, it's um, not. It's, and the differentiating learning generally takes place in the regular classroom where we where we actually group the children based on their, their level of um, performance. And we, we prepare um, activities and, and lesson plans based on how they can observe what, what you're teaching them. However, um, the inclusive learning is a little different from the differentiating learning because when we talk about the inclusive learning or the inclusive method, is really bringing the children with a general disability that will not go into the special in school, right? So there's a little difference because differentiated learning is done generally um, in the classroom, where you teach the children with different um, And Miss Sad, no, um, differentiated learning is that let us say that I am teaching fraction. You're teaching the same topic to a group of, let's say, a class. But you vary the activities according to um what um um so i said just now depends upon the ability level you're teaching the same topic but you vary the activities so the strong students will have uh, more challenging the in between will have average um, um exercise and the slower ones will give them more of a practical thing that's what yes, Jerry, that, 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 that's what it's um uh, it's differentiated learning yeah. but like you said it's a little different to the inclusive learning you will bring in the children we don't just push them up a child maybe um has mild um let me say they can hear too well but it's not on the extreme 
So for a child like that, you don't put them into the special you leave them in the classroom, but you will set um, activities, you will work with them based on your training, but you don't push them away over to the special educator for a child who has a high level of deafness, if you understand that. So I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. Yes, yes, I understand. Excuse me, as I may. The reason why I... Oh. Sure, no problem. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, we can begin to appreciate the the need of specialization in, in terms of psychological assistance to students. Um, I, in my opinion, I think with the um, implementation of this goal program, we can now have um, a decentralization or uh, amplification of the use of psychologists in the schools because this is very important some schools have a psychologist but not every school can get psychological assessment as i in my opinion i think a psychologist um teachers can't do everything that's that is a factual thing teachers they do teach and to teach based on the child's ability in my opinion but in terms of diagnosing psychological challenges or psychological disorders i think there should be a specialist, which is a psychologist, a school psychologist that should be able to counsel both parent, teacher, and child. Yes. So we need we need this system, and we need the system to be decentralized, not only in Georgetown, not only in one set of regions, but across Guyana. So I think um, this platform, this study, you know, it it will it, make make it more beneficial for the country. It is nice. Mr. Ryan, I do support you because when these children do misbehave in school, they send them to welfare. Welfare are not trained. They are not psychologists. They might do a degree in sociology, but they will yes. do everything. So they, 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 the system is now is that like welfare should solve the problem. of, And they don't have time to sit down and, and you know, interview these children and find out what is happening. You know, check their background. They might have problems at home or whatever. They ain't got time with that. They just put them in some detention or something and try to solve the matter yeah. that cannot be and that, that is so true Mr. that is not true that's not true that's not, not true that every welfare you know. no, no, that, that's not the point, true. Is, point is is that that is not we can say it's not true generally but the point is when you look at the issue of social issues that we have in schools um for instance let's take region six we have 129 schools and you have Two welfare officers. How, in the name of whoever it is, can we deal with situations like those? Exactly. So that's so, why every school should have a psychologist. Station. Even if we don't have every school with a psychologist, we can have a catchment so we can deal with it because it takes away so much from instructional hours. It takes correct, away so correct. much from whatever. It is so not. We, we it is not, not. The point is, we have. That's what you miss, Lane. The point mm -hmm. is that we have. Um, we have so many different issues, not just um not enough personnel but we have to also look at the attitude of the personnel because if persons have issues and we have a number of persons and when you go to them they don't have the strategy they don't have the skill they don't have the the, the basic ethics to deal with issues persons will continue to keep the issues to them and we continue to have an overload of issues in our society so besides us having individuals or personnel we also have to have people with the the skills to do what is supposed to be done to make a difference yes i support that but in the end it is not the job of the welfare or the probation officers to put the children on detention the job of the welfare officers or probation officers is to sit and work with the child and try to do a background check as to why the child is behaving like that exactly yeah that's the reason why i asked this question because um one time there was a child that was brought over to the hospital for me to see he was having a seizure and um he would usually be a very irritable person or child at school very inattentive um very very you know um rude and high yes so what happens is that um the the teachers uh, would complain to the parent that he you know he's misbehaving and things like that. But when I saw him, um, we realized that he is epileptic, and we had to um, treat him for a number of years for his epilepsy. 
and with that treatment, his um, behavior also, you know, tend to improve at school. His um, attention span improved and so on. So many of these things are, um, you know, you have to see the underlying cause as well. And apart from that, we also diagnosed him with ADHD secondary to what he was going through. And we put him on to a psychiatrist. But why I asked too is because this is important. It's a multidisciplinary approach. It's not just the teachers. It's not just the doctors. It's, the, it's not just the social worker. And like Ryan said, we can have the psychologists on board. We are so many of us now on this platform. We can be able to put a lot of things in place. And I think that we have greater things ahead in terms of what we're dealing with, especially learning disabilities. And you'll see, based on the area that you're living in, there is a different culture. For example, in the area that I'm working in, a lot of parents are not... Uh, what I must say, educated to the point where they understand what's going on. And so it's a difficult thing to explain to them what's the situation like. And then there's stigma attached when a child is not cooperating in school and, and the child is not doing well, they tend to remove the, child, the children from the school. And you have a lot of school dropouts, you have a lot of, um, you know, child labor as a result of it. So there are a lot of, um, you know, things that we have to look at with children with learning disability, right? So that's why I asked. It's a nice topic. And that is, and that, that is why it is important for the teachers and also with parents to have a collaborative effort to recognize if the child is not able to function in those areas. And if you can channel them into some skill training um miss uh yeah, miss true. lane um um let's go into the program well we have all done some psychology uh probably um college and then in university and the skill training i totally support that but if we refer back to the the psychology um a child has to think before he moves the hammer or he goes to wire a house or he um, has to make a cake or something. So the brain has to still function, but it's just that Correct. the brain is will tend to the one of the lobe. I can't remember which one of it. I, I can't attest to that, but probably I got read back. So there are, there has to be some thinking before a skill, um, before a psychomotor uh, try to operate. So they are children. So I we in the school system normally stigmatized. Well, here, um, these boys are bad, send them a text stream or, um, them girls is only know for cook and the bright ones there must be in business and science so there are the days that those things we have you know try change that stuff that's my take on it yes, yes. yes. Hey, I, Adi, I make a comment yes good morning good, Hello, morning. good morning everyone Hello. Hello. yes um i listen to everyone when is doing this um, remember, as teachers, we are not the ones to diagnose these disabilities. So we have to be very cognizant about it and be very careful how we get this information over to the parents because um, some of them, I'm not going to say all, they know about it too, but then, you know, they tend to live in denial when it comes to these issues, causing the problem to continue for the child and the teacher and extending as, you know, they get older. Thank you. Thank you, Yogita. Good morning, everyone. Yes, good Just morning. Just after that, I'm at, nurse, I'm at the nursery level. And what I found, a lot of times, these children are being disenfranchised because teachers don't, have, we don't necessarily have to be specialized in that area, but sometimes it depends on the severity of that problem. It just calls for a little patient because on several occasions, I would have observed children with ADHD and if that child is given the opportunity to integrate with the normal children, because at the nursery level, that child is being housed for two years. And as long as that child is given equal opportunity to integrate with the normal children at the end of that two years, you're going to see a vast change within the child. And in so saying, for example, 
you might see the child when they hear she comes of course they don't settle or anything the first thing you got to do is to ensure that that child adapts to the environment that is the first stage once you get that child to adapt to that environment the next stage is to get them to settle which is very hard however over time what you're going to find when that child is in his classroom his or her classroom and he is he or she is is observing his or her peers at some time he or she's going to realize that okay nobody else is standing nobody else is misbehaving and eventually he or she integrate and follow suit and one example i would like to share the other i had a child well he left for abroad now and when he came it was a hell of a task and the teachers they were so fed up i said not to worry i'm going to take control and i took time and i work with a child and i go with him everywhere and believe you me one day they were leaving to go outside right that was after a period of about four months and when they were in the line they were placed in the line and they went out when he got to the door i saw he turned back so i wanted to know so i followed him you know why he turned back he remembered that he did not push in his chair which is a part of the routine within the classroom and he went back he pushed in his chair not only his chair but all the others other chairs that were there so generally to sum it up these children are robbed many times the opportunity to be integrated with the normal children people are just you know they have the don't have the patient right thing so listen they don't have a special need because i know this they just need a chance to be integrated with the normal children and then you're going to see changes and that's my take and i'm at the nursery level thank you yes miss bruce that's right <laughs> yes yes uh john do you want to speak yes john unmute yourself yeah good morning yeah i would just like to say that a mental health unit the ministry of health did an intensive training in all the regions in 2021 for head HODs, focal points, and even um, primary school teachers on these very aspects of identifying but not diagnosing. Because a teacher, even a uh, mental health social worker, cannot diagnose. However, if a teacher finds that they have this child in the class and um, he's a bit different, he or she, and you may have an idea of what um, epilepsy is about or ADHD, you can actually refer that child to the Georgetown Hospital, the psychiatric clinic. There is Dr. October, there is Dr. DeClue, they're both child psychiatrists. For other parts of Diana, um, there's also a psychiatrist in Linden, there is one in, uh, there, there are those at study. But I guess when you link the child and the parent, they will know how to move forward. But remember, at no stage, a teacher cannot diagnose, not even a mental health social worker. We leave that to the specialists. So exactly, that's my Ms. June. Yes, yes, Miss June. So we need diagnosis uh, from the correct people. So psychologist, clinical psychologist, and uh, you will read about clinical psychology in your next year. Then counseling psychologist or school psychologist, school career counselors. Uh, then we also have um, psychiatrist, child psychologist. So all this has to be there. Uh, people, uh, the people need to identify their uh, roles and responsibilities, and then the correct diagnosis has to be done. It's not that social workers and welfare officers. Uh, we don't have in our country in India. We don't have welfare officers, as in uh, we have school psychologists, counselors, psychiatrists. And then the treatment, uh, when, whenever the diagnosis is done or if there are any symptoms that is diagnosed on part of the class teacher and then they're referred to, the children are referred. Uh, but yes, also we have to look as on part of the parents also, I think parents are not open. They don't want to agree. They're in denial that certain problem could happen. There are certain cases. So uh, all this has to be looked after. And I'm so happy that and glad that everybody is discussing the issues in your area. And I'm sure you all must be reading. But uh, as a career, now you have to understand that um, you have to understand that uh, uh, 
like first read psychology properly read all the all the uh, topics in psychology very thoroughly read research papers read current research papers and also dsm dsm 5 has to be read by everyone by now i think read dsm 1 2 3 4 4 tr and then 5 so uh, DSM, it's the statistical manual that is uh, again written by APA, American Psychological Association. So read them once, once in your lifetime. I mean, it's a, it's a long thing, but still you have to read. Because anyway, in your, uh, in your second year, that is your uh, counseling and clinical psychology, are going to read them. So please read them. And uh, yes, we can have more discussion on this and please read more notes on this. And uh, yes, Jonet, you want to say something? Miss Jonet, yes. Unmute yourself, please. Oh, you're unmuted, but still we cannot hear you. Can somebody else hear her? Is she audible to others? No, miss. No, miss. No. Uh, okay, Miss Jonet, uh, you're not audible. So this is all about. That's what I wanted to share about block two. Uh, they're very simple, isn't it? The notes are very simple and they're very universal in nature. So you can read them. Is it difficult in some way? No, I guess easy than block. Uh, easy than MPC one. Yes, miss. A little simpler. Is it easy? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, we, like we have seen video on ADHD, we have seen the video on ADHD, learning difficulties, different learning difficulties. You can also go online and uh, check some other uh, videos. And at the end, I just want to take you all to one more video that is a video on autism spectrum uh, disorder. And uh, and then we can wind up the class at uh, still I'm not feeling well. My ears are itching uh, because of fever, you know. Uh, yes, uh, Jonet, Miss Jonet, we can take your question. Yes, then, miss. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, you're audible now. Huh? Okay, good. Um, I was just wanting to um give uh little bit more on what everybody would have said um with the differentiating teach um teaching they um left out one part um yes it it has to do with where you're actually um giving work to the children according to their ability but then a child may be um excellent with maths but then he or she has a problem with language so with the differentiating teaching, the children will move from one group to the next based on their ability for subject area, right? Um, aside from that, um, someone made mention about the children, the special children, the special children we call them. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why Ministry of Education um, decided to um, begin to put these these particular children in the, the normal schools, as we would say, because most of them would have been at the special school um, for a number of years, but then we, we noted that they had the inclusive, where they were including the children. Um, I had personal experience with one, um, while well, I'm on the top flat where I teach grade five and six, majority of my life, um, but the child came in at grade one and well, I could not detect what which one of the um, problems she had, but when um, she came in, she would normally be like screaming and hollering, um, doing all sorts of things and picking up things and shining it around and so forth. And like the nursing school teacher was saying that that child needs to first adapt to their environment. So once that child is not adapted to the environment, they will continue to do um things that are not normal so they would they it would it's as though they're lashing out right so once you get them once you get them to to adapt to their environment you can go from that point right um i mean it's it's very hard especially when you have a class of 32 and 40 children it's mm -hmm. hard to cope with one child that has a special ability versus the others that are moving at a pace 
and most times you would find that the the children are distracted by the child who you're trying to adapt to the environment and then to get settled and so on so then sometimes when the others in the class feel that the special one is getting a lot of attention then they find reasons so for you to give attention to them also so we need to be very careful as teachers and first i don't know what um jobs the others are doing in the class but as we begin to step forward into um, becoming psychologists and you know trying to deal with these children and putting activities that would you know benefit them that they will be able to come out academically inclined just as the other children who we termed as normal you know we need to um, push each other and try to gear a better establishment for them. That's just basically what I wanted to say. Yes, Jonathan, you are absolutely correct. So, as a uh, so right now, your responsibility should be that you get the proper degree, uh, the correct license. In your country, there might be certain um, so, like in India, we have certain specialization and uh, certain guidelines that has to be followed to get a particular degree. So, to get us to become a special educator, we need be a bachelor of education, special educator, a special education. Then, to become a psychologist, we need a master degree. Uh, then we to become a clinical psychologist we need um, M field in clinical psychology so you have to refer according to your uh, 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 policies that uh, to the policies according to your region and then you can uh, become a psychologist or special educators or counselors career counselors school counselors clinical psychologist counseling psychologist or um, psychologist or consultant psychologist so all this has to be explored at the same time what other career options are available at your uh, place at your uh, region so uh, here we come to the end of block two but before that i just wanted to share about a video on autism spectrum disorder because again it's a very uh, important and common uh, thing that is coming up in young children so we can have a look on this and then we can wind up after this autism spectrum disorder is a range of neurodevelopmental disorders that involves delays in the development of many basic skills and functions including the ability to socialize and to communicate autism spectrum disorder includes conditions such as autism asperger's syndrome childhood disintegrative disorder and an unspecified form of pervasive developmental disorder the american psychiatric association reclassified pervasive developmental disorder to autism spectrum disorder the name change came in 2013 doctors don't use the term pdds anymore the condition begins early in childhood and lasts throughout a person's life it causes problems with functioning in society autism spectrum is estimated to affect about 62.2 million globally as of 2015 males are more often diagnosed than females causes the exact cause of the condition is unknown the research suggests that genes can act together with influences from the environment to affect the child's development in a way that brings about autism spectrum disorder some certain factors that may make a person be at a higher risk of developing autism spectrum disorder may include a family history of the condition, being male, having certain genetic conditions such as Down syndrome, Fragile X syndrome, and Rett syndrome, having older parents, extremely preterm babies, babies born before 26 weeks of gestation may be at a greater risk. Other disorders such as tuberous sclerosis. Symptoms. Symptoms usually are seen by the age of two years. Children with this condition can display a unique pattern of behavior and severity, ranging from mild to disabling. People with autism spectrum disorder generally have problems with social communication and interaction and patterns of behavior. Social communication and interaction symptoms are having poor eye contact and a lack of facial expression failing to or being slow to respond to someone calling their names resists cuddling and holding and seems to prefer playing alone retreating into his or her own world 
having difficulty with verbal communication, including problems using and understanding language. Having difficulty with nonverbal communication, such as interpreting other people's gestures and facial expressions. Having difficulty sleeping. Having an aggressive behavior. Difficulty expressing emotions or feelings and may be unaware of others' feelings. Having an unusual tone of voice that may sound sing-song or robot-like. Patterns of behavior are usually limited and repetitive. They may include performs repetitive movements such as rocking, spinning, or hand flapping. Have an over-interest or fixating on an object or an activity. Performs activities that can cause self-harm, such as headbanging. Being more or less sensitive than others to sensory input, such as light, noise. Develops specific routine or rituals and becomes disturbed at the slightest change. Has food preference, such as eating only a few foods or refusing foods with a certain texture. Diagnosis. There is no specific medical test to diagnose the condition. To make a diagnosis, a specialist may recommend genetic testing to identify a genetic disorder, such as fragile X syndrome, Down syndrome, or Rett syndrome. Observe the child and ask the parents or guardians how the child's social skills and behavior have developed and changed with time. Give the child tests that cover hearing, speech, language, developmental level, and behavioral issues. Choose and follow the criteria written in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM, published by the American Psychological Association. Treatment. There is no cure for this disorder, but intensive early treatment can make a big difference in the lives of many children. The goal of treatment is to improve the ability of the child to function by reducing symptoms and supporting development and learning. Treatment options include therapy, such as behavioral and communication therapy, educational therapy, family therapy, speech therapy, and occupational therapy. The type of therapy depends on the child's need. The core symptoms of autism cannot be improved with medications, although medications such as antidepressants can help to control anxiety or antipsychotics for severe behavioral problems. Thank you for watching our video. Please do not forget to like and share the video. So AD, uh, autism spectrum disorder also is one of uh, a common thing which is found in children these days. So again, as a special educator, you have to be trained to treat with this disorder and correct diagnosis and the early diagnosis as it has been mentioned is an important thing. Uh, yes, people do have this disorder even at the adulthood stage, but they have certain invention and some strategies that they could use to handle certain situation. So you can read more on this. There are various research studies, but uh, the diagnosis has to be done according to the criteria given by uh, DSM. So again, I'm telling you, um, along with reading block two, you should also start reading uh, DSM five. We do have like we have DSM one, two, three, four, and then DSM four TR, the revised version, and then the five one. So currently, everybody in all the countries DSM five is used. So make sure that you read that as well. All right. Okay. Thanks, Miss. Yes. So here we can stop the discussion. And uh, if you have any question, if you have anything to share, with re because it's a very common phenomena and uh, it could be, I mean, we can hear your experiences and it was wonderful hearing you all the situation that is here in your country, uh, in your region. Any other feedback, any other uh, pointers that has to be discussed, then yeah, we're open so we can have questions. I don't know if yes, you're reading or not. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
last month, well, today is the first. Last month was our autism month, World Autism Month um, in April. Well, today is the first of um, May. Um, we had activities, and for autism, um, the ministry has um, for pupils who have to write like grade six, I can attest to grade six because I'm at the um, primary level. Um, we will not, um, parents will normally seek help like they write. And so for the examinations at national grade six, we will have um, persons who are trained, supervisor, to read for some of the children because some of them can't read, but they could answer the question if someone read to them. So from the ministry level, we will have that, but the parents have to write, and we have to have a, as rightfully from the discussion, uh, uh, some uh, people from the doctor to say that the, the, the right relevant um, qualified person to say that this person is suffering from autism. So we will need someone to assist them in writing the examination. So they will just read the questions to them, and they will, you know, write on the um, exam paper. So that's good for us in Diana. Yes. yes, yes, exactly. Samuel. So yes, people from different situation in different uh, uh, position, they can work towards the development of certain psychological issues. You know, and they can contribute in the field of psychology from ministry level from health education level, you know, Ministry of Education and Health, that's what you all are referring, then school administration, teachers, parents, now as a teacher, as a parent, also, everybody has to be trained, what intervention strategies could be provided, because it's not that it, the, the symptoms of ADHD is going to be prevalent just in school, even even the parents, they have to learn certain techniques, you know, they can pursue some kind of course to uh, treat uh, to help their children with the, you know, the issues, right? So that's all. And uh, please read, uh, you know, read your notes also. It is not recommended to place a child on the autism in normal school due to the ability. They will not have to adapt to us firstly, but we have to understand. And the teachers, okay, I should give them the special care. Also, so please be aware of the size as teachers. Yes, 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 absolutely. So proper care has to be taken and we, are, we should also be trained. Socialization should be there. We should be trained properly as a teacher and as a parent and school administrators. That's very important. I we agree to that. So how is the learning going on for MPC one? Do you have any doubt for MPC two till date? Because now I will be having uh, just two more classes. That is MPC three and four. They're, again, they're very simple. Let me, uh, you know, I can just Take you what exactly you have over there. Um, the important theories I've already discussed about all those. So now they're talking about uh, physical changes, social cognitive changes in adolescence. So nothing, all the physical changes are there in unit one. Uh, all this has to be, you can give a reading to this. And cognitive changes. Uh, we already have discussed about adolescent, uh, the Piaget's theory. And uh, yeah. Then, Mom, did you get to find out about the? Um, remember, we had asked a question before about um, if we we should be finishing in August, right? MPC. Um, yes. Yes. Six yes. or seven. Yeah, you okay, already have the schedule, right? You already have the schedule. Yes, we have this schedule. It seems as though we're going to finish in August. But um, if our exams are in December, uh, mm. are we having a break between August and December? You said you would have uh, found out. I don't know if you got through. Well, see, I think uh, uh, for uh, your MPC course, it whenever the exam, it happens after every six months, I guess. So from August to December, yes, it would be a holiday. Uh, your schedule is still August, right? May, June, July, August. Hmm. Wait, till what time you have your schedule? No, I'm looking at the um, I'm looking at on the LMS, and oh. I'm looking at the blocks that we are going through. So for, I'm noticing that every week, mm. at least you're covering at least two uh two blocks. So mm -hmm. if we continue at that rate, 
then I, I see that you're going to finish in August, and I heard you mention it as well before. So I was just wondering if, if we are against time, or do we have time? That oh, I'm just let wondering. Me, one second, let me check my schedule. I think um, our last session should be August 28th, according to the schedule. So, during August to December, is that a period that we're going to be doing the assignments, or the assignments going to be given to us during our um, sessions? I really hope the assignments would not be given to us during that time because remember during that time we would be focusing on studying so I think at least the assignments should be given to us now seeing that the first um, course is finished that's just my thought I think we should have already been given the first assignment for the first course I agree with that that's why I asked just a second class just a second I'm just opening the schedule. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, as you I can see from the schedule, August, yes. By August, you'll be finishing your MPC 7, okay? And then May, June, July, August. Okay. So, you'll be able to finish your uh, schedule in August. That is 28th August. And then... Uh, September, October, November, and December. So uh, that is the cycle when into IGNU they conduct their exam. And for assignment also, you'll be given the time. That is, uh, again, four months, I guess. So that's what uh, you will be uh, seeing there. Uh, meanwhile, I can just invite uh, if Dr. Ashok sir can come and... Uh, So are you all worried about the assignments? I don't think so. You have to keep worrying. You studied properly. <laughs> Whatever assignments you get it, you have to you know, write it, uh, and then you can submit it. And definitely the exams, they're going to be in the month of December or January, whenever it is. So you can conduct. And then I don't think so it would be a difficulty. You already are done with MPC1. If you're reading it, then, then, then that's, that's really great. Miss, I don't think that it's a case of worry, really. But I can, mm -hmm. I think um, I'll speak for myself. But I think mm -hmm. it's a case where you know you just want to plan properly and condition your mind as to you know when we are going to get the assignments, when okay. is going to be the exam, you know what is going to be the structure of that exam if it's going to be a multiple choice. Um, no, it's not going to be a multiple choice. You'll be getting questions. Uh, you'll be getting questions for 100 marks, uh, 2 marks each, 5 marks each, and then uh, 10 marks each. So that is the schedule. It's not a objective questions. Miss, okay. on the IGNU web services, there is a PDF file which has like the assignment for MAPC January 2022. I'm wondering if that's the same set of assignments that we will be doing because it's like a general for um, July 2021 and January 2022. So uh, if we could download that and use it. But I think what we want to know is it's the same thing we're going to use so we could start it. Yes, yes, yes. Just a second, I'll just invite uh, the people from IGNU. You know, just a second. <clears throat> yes, Mrs. Basically, we just want to have a little guideline so that we understand the format and how to prepare ourselves mentally and emotionally and psychologically. <laughs>
yes sir. Uh, yes uh, class so, so ashok sir is joining and then i'll hand over the platform to him he will be answering your question he's asking for one minute just a second just a minute i guess Uh, good morning, dear students. Good morning, sir. Good morning, good morning sir. sir. Good morning, good sir. morning. Good morning, namaste. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Namaste. Good morning, namaste. Okay, actually, okay, actually, actually, I was wondering. Actually, I wanted to learn. I wanted to know. as when we meet someone today uh, in in our country say for example when we meet someone then we uh, greet them with namaste what do you say there 
in your country what do you say when you meet someone what do you say please tell me good morning hello hello what's up okay okay you say them you How say them you hello it? pardon sorry we say hello 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 okay okay you simply say hello yeah but depends yeah. on the time of the day if it's morning we say good morning if it's midday we say good day if it's the afternoon we say good afternoon if it's night time we say good night okay okay actually actually we also use these words we also greet people with good morning good afternoon good evening but in addition to these uh, good morning and good afternoon in addition to this uh, we also use this uh, particular word namaste we also use this word namaste so in addition to good morning and hello uh, do you have any specific word hello just like namaste no no nothing specific oh. sir okay 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 you you don't use any specific word okay right 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 okay uh, so no issue we may ask uh, we may ask how are you okay 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 wonderful wonderful uh, very good we may say and we uh, may say have a blessed day or a blessed day to you yes 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 these are these are the best wishes uh, we are going to yes goodness. yes okay yeah yeah dear students uh, please uh, tell me how are your studies going on fine okay mm. uh, learning a lot learning new things yeah yeah we learn quite yes. quite, learning, quite, a quite a lot quite a lot and um we have developed some coping strategies for the rate at which we have to learn these things some very um coping innovative strategies. Chinese coping strategies. <laughs> okay, uh, coping, Chinese coping. coping strategies for the psychological uh, <laughs> challenges we have. Okay, uh, what type of psychological challenges challenges you are facing? It's another way of saying that we are enjoying the class. <laughs> oh. Okay. Okay. Another way of saying we are highly stressed. <laughs> why why stressed why stressed uh, let me please explain it that uh, psychologists should not uh, uh, face stress they should not feel stress because mm. they are supposed they are supposed to reduce the stress of others now you have the responsibility to reduce the stress of other people so please exactly. please That's don't feel psychology so, <laughs> so yeah. So you you should you should be uh, you should be so helping a, others. So there is a theory says that when you are a psychologist and you are um, having people speaking their problems to you, you need a psychologist because the problems is left in you. Is, is that theory exist still? Because you don't have a, uh, no. a lot of problems. I don't yeah, know. yeah yeah I, yeah yeah you are you are right. Transferring. Yes yes. Let let me let me tell you let me tell you about this thing. That uh, this is a very challenging uh, field because in this field uh, you have to listen to all, you have to attend to their problems. At the same time, you have to protect yourself. You should not get affected. If you will get affected, then it will be a problem. so you need to protect yourself first you should you should have such type of a shield a mental type of a shield a mental shield an imaginary mental shield that whatsoever people are sharing with you you are not going to be negatively affected okay so you have to protect yourself first and only then you can help others yes sir. if you will if you will be uh, mentally affected by the problems of other people then it will be very difficult for you to help others right then the the briefing or detoxing is important 
Yes. The yes, yes, yes. Because the problems will be there and you, you have to share it with somebody else too. This is so true, sir, because the thing is with psychology, you have to listen to people's problem and there will be deep problems. There will be things that you wouldn't even expect persons would say. And you have to actually mentally prepare yourself to handle these things. If there would be persons coming to you, they would, you would actually have things or people would tell you things that would contradict your own religion, your own belief and everything. You have to find ways of how you can help that individual irrespective of whatever the issue is and many of the times these are things that you would do yourself at this point in time in the studies would think that it's wrong or it's abnormal or whatever it is you will have to actually go deep down within yourself and find a way of helping those individuals so literally with psychology you have to have a really strong mental capacity of understanding exactly. one exactly. of the things you are one of the things you have to um, establish at the end of the day that the people's dilemma is not your dilemma. So once you establish that, no matter how good scenario or bad scenario comes to you, you have to protect yourself from not allowing so people's so problem to get to you and help them. Yes. Yes. So what 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 let, me, let me, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Please, uh, let me give you one uh, wonderful example of this scenario. Uh, have you seen the lotus flower? Lotus? Yes, sir. Yes, lotus. Sir. Can, you, can you tell me the, can, can you tell me the wonderful property of lotus flower? It has a very unique property. It has a very unique characteristic lotus it bears a beautiful flower but beneath that it yes, you know it grows in a lot of mud and water you know dirty water and the, the flower up at the top is blooming and it looks beautiful wonderful very yes. very beautifully you have explained it you have explained it very beautifully now let me tell you we as a psychologist should be just like a lotus flower. A lotus flower, you have very rightly explained that we find it in mud and dirty water. Still, it is so beautiful. It is not affected by the mud. It is not affected by the dirty water. Although Although it survives in dirty water, but it is unaffected. It is totally unaffected. It is so beautiful, despite surviving in a mud, in a dirty water. So this is one of the uh, wonderful examples how we should be acting, how we should be behaving, and how we should be professionally helping the disturbed people you will meet a lot of disturbed people you will meet a lot of disturbed people in your life but you need to be protecting yourselves you need not to be getting disturbed just like your clients just like other people so you should be so strong enough you should be so mentally strong enough that you are listening to their griefs, their problems, their issues, their matters, and you are still helping them unaffected. You should be emotionally uh, involved, just like we call it empathy. Empathy is a great virtue. Empathy is a very wonderful characteristic of a psychologist. We should empathize with others, but still, we should not get affected by the problems of others. So lotus flower is a very wonderful example of this thing. A lotus flower is found in mud, but still it is far away from mud. It is found in dirty water. Still, it is not dirty. Lotus flower is not dirty. It still is a very beautiful flower. So please try to 
gain please try to inculcate please try to develop this characteristic of a lotus flower if you will be developing this characteristic of a lotus flower within yourself then you will be a very great psychologist one day right mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And it's yes. important for us to yes. do self care. Self care is important for us. Of course. That is yes. the number yes. one. Yes, very true. Very true. Yes, very true. Self, self care, too, and understanding of self, our values, our limitations, um, accepting what we can do and empowering yes. ourselves. Yes. So very once we're rooted, I, I have, um, we're rooted in our I, values sir. and understand self, then we can give care to others. And um, understanding that even in giving care, there's so much you can do, and that's the reason we have to refer. Yes. We can refer yes, to very, other um, networking agencies, so they can do what um, we do not have the um, ability to. Right, you are very right. Yes, sir, uh, so, uh, me. I have a question. Me, yes, sir. Good morning. I have a yes, question, please. please. Well, rather two yes, questions. Please. Um, please, please switch question. on. Please switch on your camera before asking question. Please switch on your camera. So that I may be, be uh, able to see you. Yes, please. Right. Good morning, sir. My first Good question morning. is with respect to our assignments. And the second question is piggybacking on that relative to when do we expect assessments? Um, I've noticed that we have completed MPC 1 and we are well on our way with MPC 2. I have seen no assignments to date and I don't think that any clarity would have been given on that other than to let us know that that would have been posted sometime during last week. I haven't seen any. Additionally, I am in a group with quite a few of my other colleagues and I have seen some apprehensions being expressed at the, or the lack of information for the want of a better term or the fact that information is not necessarily forthcoming and that is causing some apprehension and i'm asking if you can provide some clarity please okay thank okay you. thank you uh are you are you have you have you developed any have you created any whatsapp group yes sir there are quite a few of them um we would have created whatsapp there's a general whatsapp group which most if not all of the psychology students are a part of and then if you have if WhatsApp you groups respective to yes, our if you have, uh, yeah if you have created any whatsapp group then you can welcome me then you can add me in your whatsapp group if you will welcome me i will be so happy yes, please awesome. add me in your whatsapp group share your number yeah my my number uh, yes Yes, my my number. Uh, I also use WhatsApp. Uh, my WhatsApp number is. Uh, please note it down. Yeah. Uh, country code is plus nine one. Plus nine one. Then uh, my WhatsApp number is eight seven zero. Eight six two. Eight three five one five let one. Me please repeat it. Yes, uh, let me please repeat it. Yes, uh, eight seven zero eight six two eight three five one. Yes, you are very right. Mm -hmm. And country code of India is plus nine one. So if you will add me in your WhatsApp group then I will be protecting you from such type of apprehensions. Okay. Yes. Then, then I will own this responsibility. Then I will accept this responsibility and I will try to protect you from such type of fears, apprehensions and anxieties. Mm -hmm. 
because because i am dealing with future psychologists you all are going to be a very great psychologist and i am very seriously saying it <laughs> yes yes my dear students i am very seriously saying this because Thank in you. your country yes because in your country actually actually uh, your foreign minister he was uh, uh, with us in uh, our university 2 uh, 3 days back mm-hmm. your foreign minister and and uh, uh, we had we had your authorities we had uh, your authorities uh, with us in our igno uh, headquarter campus and i also attended their mm-hmm. meeting and uh, what i understand is that that in your country uh, there is a shortage of professionals if i am right i understand that there is some shortage of professionals particularly psychologists in your country so you are this batch your yours is this uh, very first batch of psychology students and i am hopeful that that uh with the help of this igno program you all are going to be a very good professional you all are going to be a psychologist and your training and your orientation it has a lot of meaning it has a lot of value because yours is the first batch which is being trained which is being oriented which is being taught by igno so after completing your two years master degree you will be playing a very important role in your country whatsoever specialization you will be doing in your second year i hope that you all remember that in second year you have three specializations and you are supposed to choose any one of out of these three one is clinical psychology second is counseling